Hi guys, welcome to the chat. Hi, I see you guys back. Um, I see some new people in the in signing on and I also see some people from yesterday. So thank you so much for coming back. I signed on just a minute earlier than I said I would be uh, so that I can actually go live on all the other streams. So give me one second while I do that. Um, YouTube. Okay. I wish there was a way where I could go live on Twitter and Instagram instantly, but I have to plug everything up and it just takes like that half a second from me when I sign on. But um, welcome back guys. For those of you who are coming back and welcome to those who are new, I, I'm going to go back and, and uh, see who's with me tonight. And I want to recognize some of you. Mary Dunford, hello and welcome to the track. Glad to have you. Um, I'll try to come back and read your comment. Nancy R., welcome back from yesterday. Glad to see you again. Hope this conversation is helpful as yesterday's was. Cherry's Jubilee, glad to see you. I missed you yesterday. Welcome back. I didn't see you. Real Talk with the D Podcast, hello and welcome back. Glad to see you another day. Annie Walker, hello, welcome. Glad to see you as well. Um, I also see Elizabeth back. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you back tonight. Live life. Glad to have you back. Deb, welcome back. Glad to have you. And John Tracy, hello and welcome. Um, I Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, I will let him know that. Uh, so let me just briefly go over something. So I had a guest on yesterday, uh, James' husband. He's a CBT uh, therapist um, who has way more experience than I do when it comes to EMDR. Uh, when I hear EMDR, I'm like, um, what? So, but he understands it a little bit better than me. And, um, and so um, I think he also understands and, and has some training and trauma. So Deb here is saying, uh, thanks again for that lovely treat yesterday. He was a great guest. Uh, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, yeah, he was a great guest. I think he did really well. So um, thank you for that. I got a lot of positive feedback about him and I'll make sure that I pass it on to him somehow, some way. So thank you for that, Deb. Um, I also see T Mac on here. Welcome back. Glad to see you. Um, hi, Nancy. I see you again. Uh, Georgie, Georgie Darce, Darce. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say it that way. Forgive me if it's incorrect. Welcome. Glad to have you. Yes, thank you so much. I am feeling a whole lot better. Thank you. Um, Sam Hain, hello and welcome back from yesterday. Glad to see you. M, hello and welcome. Says, hi, I'm new here, but your videos are helping a lot. That's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. That's wonderful. Welcome. Sammy, hello. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that sweetness. I love that. Thank you so much. That's so sweet of you. Thanks, Sammy. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing okay today. Hope you are well. Star Stories, hello and welcome. Glad to have you in tonight's live chat. Um, let me put Cherry's Jubilee. Yeah, thanks, Cherry's Jubilee. I appreciate you for doing that. Um, let me also put up the new person that signed on. You know, I have a hard time multitasking. I swear I have ADHD. I swear it's, I'm like undiagnosed. I do this every weekend and I still can't remember what buttons to push, but we'll get there. We're getting there. Um, love, laugh, live. Maggie, hello and welcome. Glad to have you in tonight's live chat says greetings to all. Thank you, Tamara, for all the helpful info and support. You're welcome. You're welcome. Don Juan, hello and welcome. Glad to have you tonight. Glad to see you. <laughs> Deb, you know, I, I swear you are my internet mom, aren't you? Thank you so much for that. I love that support. Thank you. All right, guys, let's jump in. Okay. So, you know, this topic about uh, pathological liars is pretty interesting. I have both personal and professional experience with the topic of pathological liars. And, you know, it's just, it, it's a topic where I have had such a hard time conceptualizing why we don't have a lot of research uh, that can help us understand pathological liars. We have research on disorders and personality disorders and criminals and 
you know, we have information on antisocial personality disorder and conduct disorder and oppositional defiance disorder. Like we have, you know, enough research to just go around. Sometimes I feel like I'm just burdened with clinical labels and it's like, oh, you know, stop with the clinical labeling. So we have a ton of labels, right? But why don't we have a lot of information and research on pathological liars? Like I can't, I can't wrap my mind around that. So I had to, a couple years ago, um, when I was working in a, I think this was about, mm, I'm going to say maybe 10 years ago, I was working in a juvenile delinquency center with kids who had um, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, um, and they were between the ages of 16 and 20. Um, and they had done, they, they did some pretty criminal things. You know, one committed, one of my clients committed murder. Um, another client sold drugs, another one sexual assault and rape. So like these kids, these young kids, I call them kids, they're kids to me, were pretty steep and risky in their, their problem. And when I, you know, went to my local academic library on a university campus in my area to find some research, I found very little, and I'm still finding very little uh, 10 years later. Um, so this topic is essential, right? So it's not only essential to professionals, but it's essential to those of us who have siblings who are liars. Thank God. I, you know, I'm the middle child between two boys and thank God I don't have siblings that lie, but do I have family members who do extend it? Absolutely. And I, and I also have had clients in the past who lie. And I also have clients now who have family members who have lied and it, and it has created some kind of traumatic experience for them. Now, when we bring in the element of siblings, this is where things get a little tricky, right guys? Uh, because we don't see our siblings as being dark souls, right? Or, or individuals who can commit some kind of, um, act against us that's unfathomable, right? It's hard to wrap your mind around a sibling who lies. Nobody wants to be connected to a family member who lies, but, but you know, nobody wants to be connected to a sibling who lies, right? That's supposed to be your equal. That's supposed to be somebody that you can rely on and, and be close to and, you know, go to when you need to. So, you know, it's hard to wrap your mind around this topic. So we're going to delve in. I'm going to give you some information that you need to know, but then I'm going to also share a couple of things uh, with you from a personal and professional experience. Now I'm going to go back to the chat box and a little bit here because I want to see what you guys are saying before we really get into the content, but let me just kind of help you. Um, and please guys, let me know if we're having any audio issues. Um, because yesterday I noticed that the chat was going in and out and I don't know if it had anything to do with distance or what, but let me know if there's any issues tonight. Um, but let me give you some, some context. So, so I'm going to break down three, I think very important concepts that we need to hang on to in this, this, uh, conversation tonight. The, the first concept is pathological. Now pathological line is more of a clinically based term to describe an individual who makes a statement that they know is untrue. And it's a deliberate statement that they know is untrue and they hope that you believe it. And it's pathological because there's literally no benefit, no benefit whatsoever to the lie. Most people and I, and I hate to say this, but this is what our research says. And I've seen this, you know, e even in my private practice, that most people tell a white lie, you know, here and there, right? You call your boss on the phone and you say, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sick. I can't come in, hang up the phone. And you're like, okay, let's go to the mall. Right. And so uh, my coworker does that. So sorry, Michelle, I had to put you, I had to, I had to get you there. Uh, <laughs> she does that. And so we joke about it all the time because, you know, she'll call, you know, she'll call her boss who is really her best friend. She'll, she'll call her boss and she'll be like, I'm sick today. I'm sorry. I can't. And then she'll jump out of bed and she's doing yoga on the back patio, you know, and feeding the birds and doing gardening and stuff. So, um, so most people tell white lies and our research suggests that we do typically have to, navigate our atmosphere and our environment by utilizing some form of, of, of an altered reality. I'll put it that way. So that's normal. Kids will sometimes tell white lies, right? To either avoid a threat or a perceived threat or to protect themselves or protect other people. So sometimes 
you know, lies are acceptable in that way. But when we're talking about pathological lies, we're really saying there's no benefit. You're just lying to lie. And it's really not like you're living in an, in an alternate reality because you're not. You're lying and, and you know you're lying, but you're lying and there's no benefit at all to you or anybody else. And so that's what a pathological lie is. Now, a compulsive lie is a little bit different. A, a compulsive lie is a lie that may or may not have a benefit. And it, it tends to be impulsive. It's impulsive. It comes out. And you might want to reach for that lie, but it's too far gone and you can't pull it back in, right? And so that's a compulsive lie. That compulsive lie kind of leaves your mouth and you may think to yourself, oh man, I didn't mean to say that, you know, or, oh, I didn't mean to say it that way, you know, or how did I put a spin on that? Like, I, I really didn't intend to put a spin on that story. And so that's a compulsive lie. Now, compulsive lies are repetitive, but again, they tend to be very impulsive. And so there may not be, there may not be evil intent there, you know? The other thing that I see a lot in my in my practice, private practice, when I'm treating people who have uh, complex PTSD or people who have uh, PTSD or some form of acute or, or chronic stress, what I see is what's called sensory overload. And sometimes you can be placed in a situation where there's so much sensory information coming in at you. And I go through this post- TBI. So post concussion for me, I go through this. It's like sometimes so much information is coming at me and I just can't process it. It's like, I can't grasp what it is that's coming at me. And so sometimes people who have complex PTSD or PTSD or acute or chronic stress, which is kind of like a form of PTSD. Sometimes it's so much sensory overload, too many lights, too many voices, too many thoughts coming at you, too much, too much, too much that the brain can't hold that sometimes you will, out of anxiety and fearfulness, kind of curtail the truth and the reality of a situation. Okay. And that doesn't mean you're a liar. It means you've got too much sensory overload coming in and you can't really carry this thing like you'd like to carry it. So there's three concepts. I want you guys to keep in mind as we go along in this live chat, the pathological liar, the compulsive liar, and the sensory overload. Okay. Now, before we continue on, let me go to the chat box. Let me take a little bit of a brain uh, rest here. And let me see what you guys are saying. And then I'm going to jump into the very thing you probably want to know, which is why, why, why do my siblings lie? So we're going to talk about that in a second here. Um, okay. Let me look at this. <laughs> Cherry's Jubilee says, here you are. Paper and pen. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Judges bailiff. Is that bailiff? Bailiff, I think that's Bailiff. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you. Welcome back. Says good afternoon, Tamara. It's always great seeing your lives. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. That's so sweet. I'm always glad to have you guys. Oh my God. Cherry's Jubilee, I love you. Thank you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Pen and paper. I got it. So, so here's the, here's the backstory. So anytime I need to demonstrate something to you guys, I'm really being silly right now, lighthearted. Uh, but, but when I need to write something down, okay, my common issue is I always forget pen and paper. So Cherry's Jubilee is reminding me of that. Thank you, Cherry's Jubilee. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks, Don Juan. Thank you so much for that. That's so nice. Raymond Vincent Garcia Jr. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you tonight. Deb says, I feel so happy being in this chat. So many friendly and supportive people, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I really do um, feel blessed to have all of you on this channel. So thank you so much. I, I really, really do. Thanks. Thanks, Cherry's Jubilee. I love that. I'm going to get a whiteboard. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it right behind me. Yeah. And get one of those pointers. That's that's what I need. One of those pointers. 
Uh, Star Stories 37, hello and welcome. I can't remember if I welcomed you. I think I did already. It says, my sibling is diagnosed antisocial in prison. So I'm going to focus on this in just a second here. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, diagnosed antisocial in prison. It's like having a sheep in wolves clothing. Yes. Who is your friend? Sometimes, who is your friend? Sometimes, excuse me, and threatening to stab you in the back when you are not looking. Yeah, absolutely. So let me uh, pull a little bit from this. Uh, so there is a book by, let me grab it. Hold on. Hold on. So there's a book called um, In Sheep's Clothing. And, and it is actually about dealing with manipulative people. It's Dr. Simon. So here's the book, guys, if you guys want to get it, if you haven't had it already. It's uh, In Sheep's Clothing by Dr. Simon. OK, this is an awesome book. I love it. I literally read this entire book in one day, um, literally. And and so I, I just wanted to see what, you know, Dr. Simon had to say about it. And I think it was pretty interesting. It's um, basically about sociopaths and, and individuals diagnosed with antisocial traits or personality disorder. Now, you know, a Star Stories 37 it is hard having a sibling with antisocial personality disorder be, because because, you know, it's almost like a spectrum. When when you're talking about antisocial personality disorder, it's basically a spectrum. And thanks to Cherry's Jubilee, I'm able to demonstrate this appropriately for you. So let me demonstrate this. Um, I want you to think of, um, I want you to think of antisocial personality disorder as being kind of on a spectrum, okay? And I'm going to get some slack for this, but I think we need to talk about it uh, because you guys may be wondering, why does my sibling lie and where did it come from? Some of those siblings that have engaged in lying may in some form have been diagnosed with ADHD, a form of ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder. So let me show you what, what research suggests is going on here. So sometimes, uh, sometimes if a child, um, if a child has, I can't, I literally cannot chew bubble gum and, and juggle things at the same time. Um, if a child has a diagnosis of ADHD, right? And it is not properly treated, it's not properly medicated, or it's not diagnosed formally at all, although the child demonstrates um, impulsivity, uh, inattention, they're very hyperactive. They have to constantly be stimulated in some fashion. If that is not properly treated or treated at all, then the child or your sibling, for example, who has this problem can then slide into what's called oppositional defiant disorder, or they can start to develop oppositional and defiant behavior along the way. If that is not properly dealt with or um, properly treated, then that child or that sibling can then slide into what's known as conduct disorder. And conduct disorder, uh, according to research, can be outgrown. But for those who don't receive proper treatment, conduct disorder uh, often slides into antisocial personality disorder. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, conduct disorder is the diagnosis often given to individuals who uh, set fires, they harm animals, they have uh, a juvenile delinquent kind of edge to them. Maybe they have served time, maybe they've sold drugs, done drugs, maybe like some of the kids that I used to treat, they've committed a murder, they're on trial, whatever. These young people have a conduct disorder, an inability to function in a healthy, positive, pro-social way. And if that's not properly treated, it can slide into antisocial personality disorder. Now, here's where it gets tricky because not everybody that has antisocial personality disorder can become a sociopath because sometimes it just stops at, I don't want a relationship with people. I really don't want to be connected with other people. Sometimes it stops there, but for some people it slides into sociopathy. Okay. So here, can you guys see this? I don't know if you can see this. Hold on. Let me see if I can make this work. There we go. Can you guys see that? So here's how it looks. ADHD is often first. ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, if ADHD is not properly treated, 
if ODD is not properly treated, then conduct CD, conduct disorder is often diagnosed. And if that's not treated, then antisocial personality disorder is diagnosed. And if that's not treated, then, oh God, which way am I going here? Then we're dealing with possible sociopathy. And that's where the individual uh, really has an inability to be um, rule bound or to follow rules and morals and ethics in our society. So that's the sociopath. And that's kind of what we're talking about in tonight's live chat. So stories, uh, star stories, 37. Thank you for that. I'm sorry. That was my very long explanation of uh, antisocial personality disorder, but I think it was necessary because a lot of siblings for the purposes of this, this very specified conversation uh, siblings who are pathological liars tend to have antisocial personality traits, and some of them are also sociopaths. So, okay, let's keep moving, and then I'm going to get us back into the content. <laughs> yes, Cherries, thank you so much for that. <laughs> I love that. John Tracy says, the psychopath pathological liar if their lips are moving. Yeah, usually, you know, if you're dealing with a pathological liar, there's no benefit for the lying. Sometimes it's just my lips are moving, I'm lying. Anubis, the opener of ways. Hello, long time no see. Glad to see you in tonight's live chat. Welcome. Sun and sunflowers. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you tonight. Glad to see you. Whoa, I hit the wrong button. Hold on, guys. Caleb Reed, hello and welcome. Glad to see you in tonight's live chat. Um, and you're welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us. Wonderful. Thank you, Deb. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Love it. Um, Elizabeth says, my siblings are not really liars, but are abusers, but they, are may but they maybe lie behind my back but I have no proof. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Keep in mind that individuals who are narcissistic also lie. Um, they may not be uh, uh, identified as liars because the narcissistic tendencies may be so very prominent that the lying piece of the pu puzzle gets lost. Um, but some narcissists, uh, primarily the covert narcissists who kind of hide under the surface, um, they tend to be pathological liars a lot. Now, let me say this too, before we continue to move forward in this conversation, that pathological lying is not a clinical diagnosis. It is not a diagnostic entity, meaning it is not in, I don't have it with me right now. It's not in that so-called manual that we use to diagnose people. And that's a huge mistake. And our research actually suggests we need to stop doing that, that we need to go back to the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and we need to put in there the um, either the research behind or the clinical diagnosis of pathological lying, because it is a common issue. And typically, in order to um, correctly identifies a clinical problem or a severe need, we need to have that label, right? And so some people may come to, you know, a therapist and not be a narcissist, but be a pathological liar or not be uh, a sociopath and be a pathological liar. Like, in other words, we need pathological lying to be a label of some sort, right? So I um, just wanted to throw that out there that it's not a diagnosis, but it needs to be. It needs to be. Nancy R says, I have a stepsister that lied and believed her lies. Um, it was so dark at times. It wasn't just little lies. The lies were damaging. I haven't talked with her in uh, 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. Some, and I'm sorry to hear that, Nancy R. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the pathological liar will believe their own lies. And, and that's often because because they have to form some kind of reality that is consistent with how they view reality, right? So in other words, if you want to believe that life is all rosy and sunshine and rainbows, then you have to actually do things to, to make that a reality for yourself. And so liars kind of operate that way. If they want to kind of skew reality, or if they want to kind of live out an alternate reality, then they have to make their lies consistent with their fantasy. And so some do believe their lies and some lies so much and so frequently that they get kind of swallowed up, right? 
So, so let me just skim a little bit more for comments and I'm going to give you guys some more content because you want to know why this happens. I know that's what you want to know. Annie Walker says, I can't even lie about the little, littlest thing. Me neither. Me neither. If I try <laughs> to lie, um, you will see me stutter and squirm. Like I can put on a, um, I, I can put on a, a face if I need to. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you, Annie Walker. It's really hard to lie. It is. Now, some people are not that sensitive, though, right? Um, individuals who tell white lies, you know, the, the white lies are typically survival. And that's either I can't make it to work today because I have a headache, you know, or I can't I can't take my mother to the doctor's office because my car is broken down. Little lies or white lies are typically given uh because of a need of some sort that needs to be filled elsewhere. Um, you know, so, so I get that, but, you know, just pulling something from the back of your mind and putting it out there, Hey, I went to law school and that never happened. That's an issue. And I'm going to tell you about a judge actually, uh, who was removed from the state of California court for telling lies. I'm going to tell you about that in a little bit too. Hi, Lisa Fowler. Hello and welcome. Glad to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. Welcome back. Glad to have you. Hmm. Just looking through this. Okay, guys. Um, so let me look at John Tracy. It says a pathological liar has to have a good memory. You do. You know, Judge Judy, my mom and my my younger brother, they love Judge Judy. I swear they do this every night. They they get their dinner. Okay. Sometime, sometime I'm here. And, um, or sometimes I'll see my mom and my younger sibling, they're eating dinner. Guess who they'll have on? Judge Judy. Judge Judy says all the time, all the time, because they watch it every night. And I'm like, oh God, not Judge Judy again, although I love her. But here's what Judge Judy says. If you tell the truth, you don't have to try to remember. If you tell the truth, you don't have to try to remember. And so anytime anybody will look over, she's like, nope. Look at me. Don't look over there. You know, and the, uh, you know, the person who's being tried, you know, may say something like, well, and look over this way. She'll be like, nope, look at me. You don't need to look over there. So you're right. A pathological liar has to have a good memory. You're very, very right about that. Okay, let's get back into the content. So why, right? Why? Why does my sibling lie all the time? Research suggests there's many reasons. One is to improve self-esteem, improve self-esteem. You know, sometimes you, sorry guys, it's my microphone. Sometimes, sometimes you have to lie to build yourself up, right? I'm a judge. I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm a bishop. I'm a reverend. Uh, I drive that BMW over there, you know? Oh, my daughter won first place on the soccer team last week. I'm married to her over there. Mm -hmm. I'm married to him. Yep. Yep. That's my degree over there. All of those could be lies, right? I, I had a client uh, seven or eight years ago who would come into session and lie to me. Every session was a lie. And I found out that everything she told me was a lie uh, because she got involved with the law and the police came to me for information. And I learned that her first and last name wasn't what she told me. I learned the social security number she gave me was the incorrect social security number. And I also learned that she had deceived a trail of therapists before she came to me. Um, every single session was a complete lie, but she did it because she needed to improve her self-esteem. There's actually uh, a judge that was removed uh, from his seat in California in 2001. Uh, judge Cowenberg is his name. And not only did he lie and say that uh, he, 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 he served in Vietnam so many years ago and uh, had PTSD and trauma, but he also lied and said that he had various injuries from serving overseas. Um, and he also lied about his law degree. Um, he was able to create a legal degree and make it look like he had graduated from college and graduate school and became a legal, ethical, qualified, certified judge. And it was all incorrect. And one thing that happened to him, one thing he said, put somebody on alert who then went to the higher authorities and they 
investigated him and he was removed in 2001 as a liar, a pathological liar. Um, and so, you know, he's living a regular life in California right now, but he can no longer serve um, as any kind of legal entity in this whole world uh, because he has so many charges against him, served some jail time, and his reputation is just ruined. I'll put his information in the description box for you so that you can have that information when uh, when this live goes off tonight. It's a very interesting true story about a pathological liar who said he was a judge and he really isn't. So that's one reason to improve self-esteem. Give me one second, guys. I'm sorry. Okay. What's another reason? Research suggests that manipulativeness or manipulation, I just made up my own word there, manipulation and anxiousness is often the cause for a sibling to lie, right? Manipulating mom and dad against you, manipulating how other people see you, manipulating you sometimes, you know? Anxiousness, some people just lie compulsively. Remember, a compulsive lie is an impulsive thing. It could be to kind of cloak anxiety. So you may have a sibling who talks and they just say things, but they look anxious as they're saying it because they know it's not true. Impulsivity and ADHD, remember, um, I just described that, that um, scale to you. Right. Sometimes untreated ADHD can create other issues along the way that can be the result of lying. Personality disorders, which was discussed in yesterday's live chat, that is also a possible reason for the pathological lies. Um, according to research and some of the research that I pulled as well on uh, toxic families and pathological lying, it's interesting that in most of those studies from 2001 to now shows that pathological lying actually starts in adolescence and it kind of trails off, you know, it kind of trails off when that individual hits about 30 to 35 years of age. Why that is, I don't know. It could be maturity. It could be life experience. It could be, it's no longer stimulating. Who knows? But usually pathological lying starts in adolescence and it trails off around the 30 age mark. Um, also, too, to disconnect from reality, your sibling may engage in pathological lying to disconnect, to dissociate, right? To kind of kind of detach from a painful reality, to detach from, you know, something that they have to accept or some kind of painful reality that they don't want to see in themselves, that they don't measure up, whatever. Um, so they may lie because of that. And they may also lie because they are literally confused. There's neurological conditions that can cause lying. And it's not an intentional lying. It's really a skewing of reality because they don't have the capacity to, to identify what's really happening and keep all the facts straight. So this kind of a sibling may say, you know, we went to Hawaii for Christmas and we spent 15 days there when the reality is, is that you went over your grandma's house and you spent a day there. But but it's not an intentional lie. It's because of a neurological condition, even a traumatic brain injury, even a concussion can kind of skew that sibling's perception of things and cause lying behavior. So we do have to kind of put that in there as well, that sometimes there's a medical condition that's in the way, right? Now, you may be wondering, how do we define pathological lying? Pathological lying is uh, difficult to define, but the um, explanations that I found online was kind of interesting. If you look up, if you just Google search pathological lying, you're going to see a uh, habitual liar. You're going to see compulsive liar. You're going to see uh, pseudomania. That's another term that's used for pathological lying, pseudo mania. I'm going to post this in the description box once this goes off so you can see it. Um, you're probably going to also see, I'm trying to think of the other ones, high frequency liar. That's another term that's used to describe siblings or individuals who pathologically lie. They can't stop the line. It's a continual pattern. High frequency liars. That's another term. They all mean the same thing, but they are used interchangeably. Okay, let me go back to the description box, see what you guys are saying. Uh, not the description box, I'm so sorry, the chat box. And let me see what you guys are saying. And then I'm going to tell you um, what's kind of happening here and, and how your siblings can kind of disrupt your reality and disrupt your life and your world with all of their lies. So um, let me 
kind of tune in here to what you guys are saying. Cherry's Jubilee says, I had instincts to lie whenever asked a direct question out of fear and history. So now I pause and think for at least a, a three count before I respond to avoid that dishonesty. I love that. That's good. I like that Cherry's Jubilee. So pause at least for three counts and try it again. I really like that. So let me pull on some of my training as a trauma therapist. So if you have experienced family trauma, intergenerational trauma, PTSD, complex PTSD, your brain has literally been altered. Your brain has literally been altered. And the amygdala, which is an almond sized structure in the middle of your brain, it is the part of the brain, and we talk about this all the time, it's the part of the brain that holds on to emotional memories. That's why when you are having a good experience, you are happy, you are content, or there's certain smells in the environment, foods, colognes, um, there's music, those are all emotional memories. You know, if there's a wedding, a graduation, a birth, something, your amygdala kind of grabs onto that and it holds on to the emotional pieces of that memory. And that is why some people also struggle with flashbacks because the amygdala is saying, I have a lot of emotion and I'm holding on to it. And here's what happened at this time. But if you are kind of, as Cherry's Jubilee put it, lying out of fear and, and, and kind of anxiety, there may be a neurological reason why. And the amygdala is often the reason why. So the amygdala is basically searching our environment all the time for things that could be a threat anything that could be a threat to us. And so it holds on to those emotional memories. Now, there's another adjacent brain structure known as the hippocampus. And that part of the brain gives us context, right? So Cherry's Jubilee, I'm going to use you for an example. I hope that's okay. So let's say, for example, someone asks you, um, do you remember the best Christmas you ever had with your mom? And you may automatically go into this negative memory of mom being drunk, mom not being present, mom yelling and screaming at everybody, mom just beating everyone on Christmas and there was no gifts and everything was horrific, right? The hippocampus comes along and says, yes, that's the emotion. That's the memory of that event. And now the hippocampus is saying that was Christmas day at five o'clock PM at your grandmother's house in the living room. So it gives context to the amygdala, to that emotional memory. So sometimes, you know, people who lie out of fear and trauma they're not doing it intentionally. It's really a neurological reaction or a response. Does that make sense, guys? I hope it does. All right. That was my long-winded uh, answer to that. Okay. Let's keep looking, guys. Mindset exclamation point. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you in tonight's live chat. It's been a while. Glad to see you. Judgettes, welcome back and glad to see you again, says, when too much information from groups come and they are real, are we able to say a little bit that the world is a stage? Okay, wait a minute. Let me reread that. I may have to come back to that, Judgettes. I'm going to come back to that. It's not registering for me. It's not you. It's me. Literally. My brain is like, it's not processing tonight. I'm coming back to you, though. Remind me if I forget. Lisa Fowler says, my husband is dealing with this now with his sister. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let me just throw out there, too. The pathological liars are very dangerous individuals. They are dangerous because sometimes they can lie with great intensity and they can lie so well that you can't really decipher between fiction and reality. It's really hard to determine that. When when I was in college, when I um, went to college, I studied two things. My mom was terrified I was going to have a nervous breakdown if I continued to study both fields. But I, I studied not only psychology, but I also studied 
pre-law. And in my pre-law classes, I decided to take on forensic classes. And in those classes, they were jam packed with information. One class, I had to do an internship and I did an internship in a facility with pathological liars. And um, one experience was very, very terrifying. And it was of a young man. He had to be about 20, 22, 23, somewhere around in there. And he lied so, so well on his mother that she actually was serving time in another facility because he had lied on her and, you know, really went the mile to lie on her too. Like he created evidence. This came out a couple of years ago and mom was freed, thank God. But he went so many steps ahead of everybody, um, even me. You know, I was pretty good as an undergraduate student, if I can say so humbly. Um, but I just, he evaded me. He was so evasive and so tricky that I even fell for his lies as well. But he he went the mile. He went so, so far in lying. And his lying was just so impactful and his crying and his mannerisms and his ability to put his words together and seem emotional. Uh, you know, that that is a psychopath at its core. And he had the ability and the charm to to deceive everyone. So a pathological liar is very dangerous because sometimes they are sneaky enough to try to cover their lies too. They're going to lie. And especially if this is a sibling and they have inside information about you, that's what makes it even more terrifying, right? The, the pathological liar knows you very well, especially if it's something as close to you as a sibling. So that makes it worse. So, you know, liars can be very evil and very, very detrimental. And if there's if they're psychopaths, right? Or individuals who have antisocial personality disorder, then you're dealing with a bullet, for lack of a better word, because they're coming after you. Um, I, I once told one of my my colleagues, you know, you better get away from that client because that client uh, has lied on her attorney, lied on the on her judge, lied on her family, you're next. And sometimes it goes that way too. And that's the scary part. So I'm sorry to hear that, Lisa Fowler. It's hard when the liar is staring right at you and they're right in your same vicinity. <clears throat> Hi, Phoenix. Welcome. Glad to have you tonight. Says, I'm late, but it's been a day. <laughs> Tell me about it. Says, glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. Welcome back. Uh, uh, Raymond Vincent Garcia Jr. Says, that makes so much sense with the sensory overload. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Liberty can welcome. Glad to see you. Says some are just master manipulative people. They are. Yep. I just got done talking about it. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Raymond Vincent Garcia. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, I am. I'm feeling a whole lot better. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Pathological, pathological liars will deny, deny, deny deny, deny, and deny again. Compulsive liars are a little bit different. Compulsive liars may break under pressure. Those are the individuals that you usually see in those movies where they're separated from another criminal so that they can be a little bit more vulnerable and easy to break. And the detective is all over the table yelling and screaming and throwing things and you know really trying to intimidate. And, and a compulsive liar will deny, 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 but then they'll break under pressure. you know, And they'll say, I don't know why I did it. And they'll scream and cry and throw things and just, you know, let you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I, I don't know why I lied. I don't know why I did what I did. You know, pathological liars, on the other hand, you're not going to get that out of them. They may be very calm, cool, and collected. They tend to be way more strategic than the compulsive liar. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Annie Walker. Yep. It is an excellent book. She's talking about this book in sheep's clothing. Okay, I'm going to get us back into the content. Let me continue to read some of these uh, so that you guys can see what's going on in the chat box. It's very active tonight, so glad to see that. Um, <clears throat> uh, Raymond says, I have that book. So insightful. Yes, it is. Yep. Yeah, I might have been. So I'm in my... Um, mid thirties. So I must, I, I think I may have been like 22 when I was reading this um, because I see where I underline a whole lot of chapters in this book, but I was literally like this, you know, in my, in my bed one night, do, you know, as I'm studying and I'm like this book, I can't put down. So you're going to like it. 
Okay, let's get back into the content. You know what? Let me read this one because this one is a little bit relevant here uh, to the next part of this chat. So let me read uh, Sun and Sunflower says, my sibling uh, has been lying on me since a child. Parents went along with it. She is lying. Now we're middle-aged. Invites me to her anniversary only to attack me and spread rumor I was mean drunk to her friends. Wow, that sounds really complex. Let me highlight too, first of all, I'm sorry you're dealing with that. Let me highlight too that pathological liars, again, are just not liars. Sometimes they have personality disorders. Sometimes they are very confused about the reality. And sometimes they are just very reactive individuals, you know, emotional, and they have dysregulation issues when it comes to emotions. And so they engage in the lying behavior as a means of self-defense, um, as defensiveness, and sometimes as pure evil. Um, and if it's a sibling, again, that has inside information about you, meaning they know your buttons, they know where you're vulnerable, they know your information, they know how to spread things about you, they know how to manipulate the family dynamic. Those are all inside pieces to the puzzle that makes a sibling to me, the most dangerous liar that there is. Okay, let's get back into the content, guys. So you may be wondering, you know, what's going on here? Well, why, why does my lying sister deny even when she's caught in the lie? Why does my lying brother continue to lie knowing that most of us know he's lied before? These are questions that I hear all the time in my practice. And so... I think the most important thing to keep in, in mind and also to keep before you with a sibling like this is that they have to lie because when they lie the first time, they have to lie again so that it will be consistent with lies that they're going to either tell in the future or it can be consistent with who they are in the now. So let me go back over that. A pathological liar, in order to kind of... Um, keep the same story going or to keep up a front or a defense, they have to lie repeatedly so that their lies will be consistent with maybe a previous lie or their lies will be consistent with who they are. If they tell so many lies and try to go back and undo those lies or, you know, it, it's going to be hard for people to believe them. So they have to continue to tell lies. And so it becomes kind of like a disorder at that point, right? And this is what research is saying. It becomes a disorder when the pathological liar gets into the habit of lying. And sometimes compulsive liars can slide into pathological liars because they can't stop the lies. For example, your sibling who is a compulsive liar, they lie out of anxiousness, fearfulness, or impulsivity. Maybe they told one of your mutual friends, I went to law school. Well, they can't go back and say, I'm sorry, I lied about that. That's going to undo the image that they now have gained by saying that they went to law school. So what do they have to do? They have to play that up even more and maybe even create a degree. This is this is what previous Judge Kallenberg did. Um, create a degree, get a very real looking symbol, put it on the wall, right? dress like an attorney, learn to talk like an attorney or a judge, whatever. So the lie has to continue to be consistent with their reality. And so that's what research says is sometimes, excuse me, the reason for liars continuing to lie and lie and then deny and lie again. Does that make sense, guys? I hope that makes sense. Also to social cognition. So kind of how they see the world. This is another reason why your sibling may lie. How they see the world is skewed in the first place. And so sometimes they lie in order to exist in the world that their mind tells them that they live in. So they live in an alternate reality. And in order to function in that alternate reality, research says that pathological liars have to continue to lie in order to live in that alternate reality. You can't live in an alternate reality if you don't, you know, kind of bend things to fit that ultimate reality. So sometimes pathological liars will bend, deny, cheat, deceive, whatever they need to do, whatever they need to do to kind of live in that alternate reality. Now, Pathological liars have a way that they condition you. So let's say, for example, your brother has been a liar since two years old, you know, 
Sometimes kids will tell little white lies, but those little white lies, if they're not caught in time and if proper morals are not taught, that lying behavior can continue on down the developmental path, age 20, age 30, all the way to older adulthood. Let's say, for example, that's your brother. All he does is lie. He, he lies about everything. And sometimes he lies about things that never happened at all, right? So he's kind of conditioned you. And he's also conditioned himself to be a part of those pathological lies. And so let me ask you, before I go to the chat box and take a break before we continue on, let me ask you, have you second guessed yourself with your pathologically or compulsively lying sibling? Have you second guessed yourself? I've been in a situation with an extended family member who has lied and I started to second guess myself because the lie is so convincing, right? And you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, I know better than this. Why am I doing this? Like, why am I second guessing me? I know what the truth is. And it's because that pathological liar has not only conditioned themselves to lie and believe their own lies, but they have conditioned you. Okay, let me take a break. Let me see what you guys are saying here. <clears throat> yeah, John Tracy is saying exactly what I'm saying in this live chat tonight. Narcissists believe their own lies. Yes, they do. Not all, most, most. <clears throat> Deb says, did you watch Diary of a CEO where Stefan interviewed Dr. M yes. Yes. Thank you for that, Deb. Thank you. Yep. Go check it out, guys, if you haven't. <clears throat> yeah, I like that Cherry's Jubilee. Cherry's Jubilee says, and this is about pathological lying, make it all symptoms and stop putting a name to the clusters. Yeah, that would be really cool, I think. Um, but unfortunately, we can't do that because those of us who practice psychology, we have to have those clusters to kind of help us understand things and have a common language, if you will. But I agree. I also think we need a diagnosis that says pathological liar, because sometimes, sometimes a pathological liar is just a pathological liar. They're not a sociopath. They're not a narcissist. You know, they're just a liar. So, you know, usually when I'm doing clinical documentation and I know that I have a pathological liar sitting in front of me, what I have to do is number one, I have to diagnose them with something. And, you know, what I would put is sometimes I would go with whatever symptoms they're telling me they have. So like an anxiety disorder or a depression, or some kind of depressive episode, or maybe there's schizophrenia, whatever. I have to give that diagnosis. But then I also can put in my clinical documentation that this is an individual who has been caught in several lies uh, spoke with the doctor who caught the patient in a lie, uh, spoke with the patient's attorney who stated that the patient lies, uh, spoke with the patient's mother and extended family and confirmed the lies. You know, so you can put doctors and therapists can put that in the, the clinical record. But unfortunately, we don't have a label. We need a label. We do. Great question, Cherry's Jubilee. I'm going to go back to you again. Cherry's Jubilee says, or she asks the question, is pathological lying genetic in any way or is it learned? I think it's both. So research suggests in studies of twins that pathological lying can be genetic because there is some genetic predisposition to personality disorders, narcissism, antisocial personality, borderline personality, you, you know what I'm talking about, guys. So there's typically some genetic predisposition. But then lying can be learned. Yeah, mom and dad lie, you know, sissy lies, my brother lies, my aunt Nini lies all the time. And learning to lie can also be kind of intrinsically valuable. In other words, you get rewarded every time you tell a lie sometimes, right? It gets people off your back. It, 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 it gives your boss the green light to give you a day off. Um, that one was for you, Michelle. Um, you know, it, it, it gives you the opportunity to kind of evade the truth sometimes or avoid the truth. That's what I'm looking for. So sometimes there's some intrinsic reward and that reinforces the line, you know? So yes, thank you for that, Cherry's Jubilee. That was great. 
Live Life says, I can understand people lying because they fear the consequences of telling the truth, but lying for the sake of lying, for the sake of it, is something I can't fathom. It's totally dysfunctional. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, guys. I'm totally with you. Um, anytime I would work with a uh, pathological liar in the past, which, you know, if I see them coming within a mile of me in today's world, I'm like, nope, I'm not the right clinician for you. I, I can't. I just can't. Uh, but your right live life. It is. It's it's hard to fathom. And uh, former Judge Cowingberg, he's a prime example of that. He didn't have any benefit. You know, why lie and say that you served in Vietnam? Why lie and say you have all these medical conditions that you don't have? Why lie and say that you were shot with bullets and you weren't? Why lie and say that you were married for 22 years and you weren't, right? You know, why also create a degree and put it up on your wall and act like you went to Harvard so that you can become a lawyer? Why? There was no benefit to that because in the long run, he got caught and he lost all opportunity to have a career. His career is shot, right? So, you know, pathological liars are tricky. There's no real valuable reason to lie. Now, a compulsive liar may have some reason, but, you know, we need more research. So totally over says, wow, antisocial personality disorder is on a spectrum. They have ADHD. Yeah, sometimes. Absolutely. Sometimes, uh, you know, antisocial personality disorder is the result of impulsivity. Sometimes it's also the result of not being able to stay in school and pay attention and and really take in information. Uh, sometimes juveniles who drop out of school or they emancipate themselves. That's what it's called here in the U.S. They emancipate themselves. They leave school prematurely without a parental guardian's permission. You know, sometimes they have antisocial personality disorder or traits. And the reason they dropped out of school is because they couldn't focus for long periods of time. They weren't grasping chemistry class and geometry and English class, or they skipped so many classes going to the club down the street that they failed every test. And so, you know, I do want to put out a disclaimer that not all individuals with a diagnosis of ADHD is a pathological liar or a sociopath or have antisocial traits, but some do, some do. I digress, Sherry's Jubilee. <clears throat> Gorilla Twist, hello, and welcome to the chat, says, my sisters and brothers will lie always. Gifts is another secret lie. Ooh, pretending it's a nice present. Yeah, it's, path it, it's, it's pathological, but it's passive aggressive. It's passive aggressive. <clears throat> I, I agree with that. Welcome, Empowered Woman. Glad to see you. Welcome to the chat. Happy Saturday to you, too. Glad to see you. Sammy says, I lie by not answering the question while still answering it. Okay, let, let me process that. Right. Right. I can't. Yeah, that's a good one, Sammy. You said a politician style. Yeah. I don't want to go the Bill Clinton route, but is that kind of where you're getting at? I did not have, you guys know the rest of that. With Monica Lewinsky. Is that kind of what you're talking about, Sammy? That kind of line? <laughs> maybe, maybe. We all have proof, but you're still going to lie. All right, guys, let me get back into the content, okay? Because I could continue on. You guys have so many comments. I'm coming back to you before we sign off. Now, we left off at lying as uh, the sibling kind of conditioning you to believe their lies. So they've conditioned themselves to believe their own lies, and now they're conditioning you to believe their lies. Now, there's also a learning component. And, you know, what? one of you guys brought it up earlier about learning to lie. Sometimes pathological liars, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes pathological liars learn to lie from their parents, right? 
And so, you know, these kind of parents uh, may have, uh, you know, used white lies to get out of things, or they may have curtailed the truth here and there. And if that child has a, a, a genetic predisposition to something, then, you know, let's say as they develop over time, that genetic predisposition can become a personality disorder like narcissism, antisocial personality, borderline personality. And then over time, right, with that personality disorder, they begin to lie because they're genetically predisposed and they've also had that behavior modeled. So learning is an important piece of the puzzle. The other thing is most pathological li liars and siblings who lie, they recognize the reaction in other people that they get when they lie. And so maybe there's a positive reaction to them when they tell lies. And that kind of reinforces their lying behavior because they're getting some kind of social reaction or some kind of reaction from the person they're lying to. So they might be praised. They may be misunderstood to be telling the truth. Um, they may also be seen as a hero or as a, a positive person for they're lying, but for supposedly telling the truth, right? Uh, they may also get some kind of internal stimulation from knowing that they are telling a lie and yet they are being believed. That would be Machiavellianism, which is that, that, that psychopath piece of the puzzle that I love being a trickster. I love being a deceiver. I love keeping people confused. And so a sibling that has the trait of Machiavellianism, that deep desire to get over on people because it's fun and it's stimulating and it drives them, these kind of individuals may get some kind of, you know, social reward internally for telling the lie in the first place. Does that make sense, guys? I hope it does. Um, the other thing, too, is sometimes the sibling who engages in pathological lying, th they may be so conditioned to your reaction to them lying that it kind of reinforces it so they do it again. So compulsive liars can sometimes fall into a habit where, you know, they tell a lie you begin to react. You don't know you're reacting. Maybe you just have a very obvious face and that compulsively or pathologically lying sibling continues to lie over and over and over again because they not only expect your reaction, but they're very familiar with it. You know, they're very familiar with your reaction. And so there's no fear there. There's no boundary. There's no, there's nothing. So they lie repeatedly. They lie on you. They lie about you to other people in the family. They do whatever they have to do to lie and to create chaos all around you. And they do not have any fear that you're going to tell on them, reveal them. They don't have any of that fear because at that moment, they are telling a lie that they either believe or they know is a lie. They expect your reaction. There's no fear. There's no boundary. There's no respect. They do whatever they want to do. It's a very anti-social sociopathic kind of disposition. Very narcissistic to say the least. Let me give you two reasons before I go back to the chat box. Let me give you two reasons why you may be upset with the sibling who constantly lies. One very good reason is what's called central nervous system dominance. Okay. It's really fight or flight. Anytime your sibling lies and you know, they are lying, your fight or flight mode gets kicked off. And when you go into fight or, fight or flight mode, right? You either put up your dukes and you're ready to fight or you back down and say, you know what? I don't want to do this. And you go somewhere else. Sometimes you may freeze as a trauma response, as a fear response, as an anxiety response, you freeze, right? And so your sibling may know that about you. They may know that they're going to tell a lie and this is how you're going to react. So keep that in mind. If you have a sibling that lies and you're used to all the lies that they tell, just know that your brain probably sends you into fight or flight mode. You start to get kind of flooded with stress hormone. You know, your temperature is rising. And so that's one common reaction to a pathological liar. Another common reaction to a pathological liar is the amygdala. Again, the amygdala is like a flashlight. 
and it's constantly searching in the environment, everywhere that you walk, everywhere you go, it's searching the environment for threats, any threat. And so your sibling is a threat. So when a lie comes out or you hear a lie or you've been told about your sibling lying, whatever, your brain is going to respond. That's just how it goes, especially if you have a history of trauma. Okay, I think I give you everything. All right, let's go to the chat box. Let me see what you guys are saying. And then we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Okay, Empowered Woman says, my older sister created a whole fantasy of her life. Absolutely, absolutely. You wanna keep in mind, and I doubt if this is your situation, I'm throwing this out here as a, an educational piece to this puzzle. A pathological liar um, may lie because they have, again, a neurological issue that's getting in the way. They truly believe what it is they're saying, or there's some kind of kind of medical condition. There's a variety of forms of amnesia. And I'll post a video in the description box below as soon as we sign off here that um, I did a couple years ago on traumatic memories and traumatic forms of amnesia. And so there's one piece of amnesia um, where an individual individual can lose consciousness and they can come back and totally forget who they are, totally forget their name, where they live, you know, why they're driving, where they're driving. There have been stories where patients have, have developed uh, a certain amnesia where they don't remember their name. They don't remember their siblings. They don't remember anything. And they create a whole different life, a whole different um, identification. You know, they may not even recognize how they look in the mirror. So. Um, I, I figured I would just throw that in there. Sometimes there's a medical reason for that, but for the most part, it's just a pathological liar doing his or her thing. This is how they are. Live Live said, that's scary that someone could deceive so many people to the point of serving as a, a fictitious judge. Yeah, isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? And there's elements to that story that I'm not going to get into. Uh, but, but you know, uh, there's definitely some politics associated with that, right? Uh, there's also some uh, ethnic and racial advantages there, that, you know. So we could just go on and on and on. Um, but, yeah, he got away with being a judge. He tried a few cases. He was there for a long time. It's a scary story. <clears throat> Deb says, we all have seen pathological lying in the U.S. government. I mean, George Santos, yep, is a poster boy for pathological lying. Ouch. Okay, I'm not going to comment on that. But Deb, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. You know, we do have politicians who curtail the truth. They give us an alternate reality, you know. Um, okay, let's keep going here. Raymond Vincent Garcia says, my siblings didn't really lie that much, just some white lies, but my father-in-law, he lied all the time. I asked him, why do you lie all the time? He told me, I don't know, it just comes out. Right, right. So you want to try to figure out, you know, um, is he is he lying all the time and doesn't know why because he's a compulsive liar? Does it just happen out of impulse? Or is he nervous and fearful and anxious? And that's why the lies come out. At least he admitted it once you addressed it. But that's, that's, yeah, that's a lot to take in. Cherry's Jubilee says, my brother would smile and laugh if you question him too well. And he plays it off as plain. Yeah, absolutely. So you gotta, you know, you kind of have to ask yourself, is he a sociopath or is he just an individual that just thinks he can get away with this? I don't know. Not everything is clinical. <clears throat> I like what John Tracy says here. Yeah. <clears throat> Delusions of grandeur. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You guys know what delusions of grandeur is? It's basically a, a false belief that's held to be true, that you are better, that you are grandiose, that you are great and wonderful and bigger than everybody else. You might even be up there with God. That's kind of like this delusion, delusional way of seeing yourself. So delusions, delusions of grandeur. Or you can even say um, grandiose delusions. Uh, Sun and Sunflower says, a sibling is horrible, lying on me and brother took medical leave because she went off her, I think off on her boss and close to getting fired, went to group therapy, doctor gave medicine, but she refused. Yeah, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. She refused to take it. Yeah. <clears throat> don't expect a pathological liar to admit they have a problem. You also don't want to expect a pathological liar to take medication and go to therapy. A lot of them don't think they have a problem until their pathological lies kind of encircle them like a coil or like, you know, some kind of a rope. You know, they almost have to wind themselves into a bind before they say, oh, boy, my lying has gotten me here. You know. Oh, yeah. Deb says trauma will make you feel exhausted. Yes. Chronic fatigue. I'm finally regaining energy as I heal. Yeah. You know, I think I shared this with you guys once before. I think self-disclosure from a professional is healthy sometimes because you get to see me as very human. Um, so for me, a couple of years ago, I want to say 10 years ago, maybe, yeah, about 10 years ago, I had to take off from grad school. Um, I did three years of college. Then I went back the day after my college graduation for grad school. My classes started the very next day. And I did that for an extra two years. And I did some kind of professional internship in a hospital for two years. And so my whole educational experience burned me completely out, Deb, uh, you know? And so I can relate to this. I think I suffered compassion fatigue. I just got so, so tired that I literally had to take a whole entire year off just to reboot. So this is the reboot, the, the rebooted Tamara. This is, this is the rebooted me. Um, but Deb, I totally get you. I had to take a whole year off. It was just, it was a lot. Okay, let me keep going. We're gonna look at these comments. I don't wanna miss any of you. Hello, stranger. M2 Holistic Studio, hello and welcome. Glad to have you. Says, hi, Tamara. Does a sociopath usually start with misdiagnosed ADHD? Do they always start hurting animals? Any books you recommend on this? The only book that I recommend is In Sheep's Clothing. This is really the best book to get if you wanna understand a psychopath and a sociopath and how they operate. Um, and I'll explain what the differences are here in a second. Um, no, sometimes sometimes an individual who's not diagnosed with ADHD can get the label uh, uh, antisocial personality disorder. You know, sometimes they are misdiagnosed with ADHD and sometimes they are not. Um, so it really just depends on kind of um, what we call the individual's profile. You know, how were they as children? How were they as adoles uh, adolescents? How were they as young adults? Um, so sometimes they are misdiagnosed. Sometimes they are, aren't. And then, no, they don't always start out with hurting animals. Sometimes they set fires or they engage in a lot of property destruction or they are accomplices to robberies and burglaries, things like that. Now, the differences between a psychopath and a sociopath is really thin. So here's the difference. A sociopath and a psychopath are really the same thing. It's the same animal. The only difference is a psychopath tends to be uh, way more methodical strategic, charming, and skilled. A sociopath is very clumsy. They're very clumsy. They're going to get caught at some point. They do everything a psychopath can do. The only difference is they are clumsy and a psychopath is not. A psychopath is your uh, Jeffrey Dahmers. There you go. Um, so there, there you have it. That's really the difference there. But they're basically one and the same. They just get used differently in different contexts. Uh, Live Life says, I lie about being okay when I'm not. Yeah, I do it too. Don't feel bad. Surviving an abusive upbringing made me way too good at masking my feelings. Yeah, I I'm not even sure I would consider that lying. I do it too. Sometimes I have a lot on me. I'm burdened. I'm burdened about my clients. I'm burdened about my family. I'm, bur you know, burdened about loss in my family. You know, we have uh, someone in our family now that's going through health issues. So in my family and, and my mom and my siblings, um, and so, you know, sometimes my clients will come in and they're like, where's that happy, positive spark that I know in you? And I'm, I'm just not there, you know? And so I'll say, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. How's things been for you? And that's how I downplay that. And I move on. Right. So I'm not sure I would say that's lying live life. I think I would say that that's kind of cloaking or minimizing. Right. And it's a form of survival. You know, you're saying I have to cover this so I can get through to the next stage. Okay, let's keep going. I'm going to wrap up here in like literally two seconds. 
and I'm going to mess this up. Beva Ayan, Ayan, forgive me, says, I found out my ex was one and I disappeared like Nemo. Oh, that's a good one. Welcome to the chat, by the way. Glad to have you. Yeah, I mean, you know, anytime you have a, a spouse that lies, a friend that lies, a coworker that lies, number one, I think it's fair to give uh, some kind of uh, leeway or flexibility. Make sure that their lying was not intended to hurt you. Maybe they were trying to do something else. Uh, but, you know, to me, once a liar, always a liar. That's what I've seen. Yeah, I like that Liberty Can. Liberty Can says they rewrite history. Yep, they do. This is how they function. Um, M2 Holistic Studio says, what can be done to recover neurologically from complex PTSD? Oh, oh complex CPTSD. That's what I'm trying to say. Any books you recommend on this? Yeah. Oh, man, and I love him. He's great. No, but I'll post some of his videos in the description box, okay? That's a great question. I don't have any books that I recommend. Uh, for complex PTSD. Now, if you want to read a book about um, trauma and complex PTSD, let me show you this book. Give me one second. I'm always afraid to move. I don't want to disconnect anything. <clears throat> so, because there's always tech issues on this channel. It never fails. So here's an awesome book. And uh, I, I bought this years ago when I I started seeing children and adolescents in, a, in an environment uh, where they had been traumatized. This book, it's called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. And it is by Dr. Perry. It's an awesome book. It's, it's a pretty thick book, right? It looks like a dictionary, but it's wonderful. Here's what the cover looks like for those of you that may want to get it. Um, and really what you're going to find in this book is a... Um, a definition of childhood trauma and how that impacts you over time. And the story, uh, the stories that are in here are pretty impactful. So um, this book I think is great for both professionals and lay people. So people who wanna know a little bit more about trauma. Okay, let's keep going through and then we're gonna wrap up guys. Keisha, Monique, hello and welcome. Glad to have you in tonight's live chat says, oh my God, Tamara, yes. Why do people believe the pathological liars don't exist? Because it goes against the grains of what we've been taught as a society, right? We've been taught people don't lie. Judges will never lie. You know, they're close to God. Uh, therapists, psychologists, doctors, they don't lie, right? Most people are, are good natured. They don't lie. The reality is, and according to some of the research in psychology, uh, a lot of people lie, you know, and they lie sometimes every day. Uh, years ago, I had a colleague that lied and, and told me she was engaged to be married and she wore a ring on her finger. She was not engaged to be married at all. So, yeah. Ari Andrews says, hello and welcome to the chat, by the way. We're going to sign off here in a little bit. Says, my sister lies so much, it makes my head spin. She betrayed me. And when I told her it hurt, she said she had to do it to save other family members. I am an, an abuse enabler. Yeah, sometimes enablers of abuse. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I'm sorry you had to deal with that, uh, Ari Andrews. Sometimes pathological liars, compulsive liars, um, they are enablers of abuse. Sometimes those kind of liars are driven not so much by impulse, uh, but more so driven by an altered reality. They have to tweak that reality uh, to live it or to be a part of it. They have to create a different, uh, an alternate reality. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> Welcome to the chat. So glad to have you, Princess. Says, good evening, everyone. First Nation is watching. I love to see that. I love that. Lola Sunshine, hello and welcome. Glad to have you. Says, this topic is so, so sadly familiar to me. Yeah. Isn't it sad? It is. Because it makes you second guess just about everything. Sarah Pinto, hello and welcome, glad to have you, says lying as a result of complex trauma as a means of survival is a whole different thing. Thank you uh, for naming that, Tamara. Yes, you're welcome. Absolutely, you're welcome. 
Anaphylaxis, hello and welcome. Glad to have you back and glad to see you in tonight's live chat. Says my sister would say, I don't recall saying that. Yeah, that's a good way to lie, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> most people who are in court, they use that all the time. But my cousin's a, a judge, but she was an attorney, a criminal uh, attorney for a long time. And um, I have a colleague who's a, an attorney. And one of the things between the two of them that I learned you should say in a court of law is I don't recall. Did you put that knife down by the bed? I don't recall. Do you do you recall uh, opening that door at 7 p.m. Eastern time? I don't recall. Uh, please take a seat. I don't recall. Oh, my God. It's like I don't recall. I don't recall. And to me, it's so annoying. But to me, it's a way to just give yourself some leeway to lie. I don't recall. Yeah. That's a tool that that uh, uh, judges, not judges, I'm sorry, attorneys uh, will often tell their clients to use. Okay. Hello, Phoenix. Welcome to the chat. Glad to have you says. I'm glad to see you feeling better. Thank you so much. Me too. I'm glad to feel better. Um, Phoenix says, I'm going to look into that book. You got interested. <laughs> Thanks for the recommendation. What was the author's name again? Um, okay. It depends on what book, uh, Phoenix in sheep's clothing is Dr. Simon. I don't know if you can see that. Probably not. I'll put it in the description box for you guys. And then this book was the boy who was raised as, as a dog by Dr. Perry. So Dr. Simon and Dr. Perry, I'll put these in the description box for you guys. Okay, let me just scroll through uh, before we sign off. I learned so much. Thank you, Tamara. You're welcome. You're welcome, Nancy. Um, okay, let, let me keep looking. I don't want to miss any of you before I sign off. Alexis, hello, and welcome to the chat. Glad to have you tonight. It says, wow, my mom and younger brother do this. This is so obviously false, but they still do it. Yeah. Absolutely. The lie is so obviously false, but they still do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sorry, guys. My camera's out of focus. Ooh, there we go. Okay. That's how you know it's a good book. It helps with my technology. Um, I will read this one. Georgie Duras, their sauce. Okay, I messed that up. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. It says, my sibling makes some things accidentally on purpose, immediately denies it, makes me second guess myself, which puts me into paranoid thinking. I started having gastrointestinal issues from stress. Absolutely. I would too, right? A, a, a pathological liar's best tool is this. And, and my mentor is wonderful for several years of my entire career, my mentor has taught me some things. And one thing he taught me is the, the best tool a pathological liar will use is, is the, the circular reasoning that they do, right? They take you around and around and around, right? And you think you're getting somewhere different and they turn off and they take you right back where you didn't know you would end up. And so that's their tool. That's, that's how they do it. I'm sorry, you have to deal with that. Yes, Deb. I love this community too. It's wonderful. It is. It is. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Andrew says, yes, Tamara. Uh, the unshakable certainty of these liars. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are very arrogant too. Okay. Scrolling through just to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Um, I don't want to leave. And somebody has a really good comment. Yeah. Billy Wiggins. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you in tonight's live chat says Clinton was a master at lying. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything to say to that. I'm just not going to touch it. Uh, Elizabeth says not so much. Yeah, that's obvious. I, I'm not going to even No. Mm -mm. <clears throat> B, hello. Welcome to the, the chat. Glad to have you tonight. Says, oh my goodness, I love your polka dots and checkers blouse. Thank you. Seriously? Okay, this is to give you guys just a little bit of humor and a mental break. I literally put this on. I grabbed this off the wall because I'm cold. Okay, I have that fireplace on and that fireplace and I'm still freezing. I don't know what the issue is. I'm like, I need this. And I'm like, I am so mitch matching today, but it is Saturday. Who cares? So thank you so much for that. I, I really feel sane now. 
I'm like, they're going to think something's wrong with me. I have polka dots, squares, you know, thank you, B. Justice, hello, and welcome to the chat. Glad to have you. We're going to sign off here in literally two seconds. I said that three minutes ago, but we're going to sign off. Justice says, my siblings are definitely, they definitely have Machiavellianism as a trait. I'll put it that way. They love to smear and actually get a high off of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or organic black. Hello and welcome. Glad to have you. Says, oh my God, my youngest sister was a habitual pathological liar. The title of this live stream is everything. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the super chat. Organic black. I appreciate that. You guys never have to do that, but I appreciate you for the super chat. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, the title of this live chat is the result of so many clients that I've seen over time. Deb says that Tamara, so glad you had the strength and support to take that time to reset yourself. Kudos. Wish I had had that much self insight. Thank you so much, Deb. Yes, I think you're very, very insightful. Sometimes I think we just get caught up in, in what we're doing that we don't realize we need to really hit the brakes. Um, I attribute my faith to that. And I also uh, attribute that to my mom. My mom is like, Tamara, hit the brakes. And even now, you know, almost um, pushing 39, my mom still jumps in and she's like, pump the brakes. That's enough. That's enough. Don one says I'm in the gym watching. I feel better. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Don one. Don one. I love you. You're like babysitting and watching me You're at the gym watching. You're awesome. Princess says, so grateful for this channel, Tamara. Thank you so much for that. Grateful for you guys. Okay, let's let's wrap up, okay? I'm way over time. Ooh, Annie Welker has another book, Surviving to Thriving CPTSD. Thank you so much, Annie Welker. There's the book, guys, if you want to get it. It's up on the screen. Thank you, Annie. I really appreciate that. Um, Courtney Frazier, hello and welcome. Glad to have you in tonight's live chat. No, you are not late. You're not late. Um, John Tracy says power and control. Yep. Annabis, the opener of ways says, thank you, Tamara, for your time. Tamara, have a good evening to the chat. Good e evening to you as well. We're going to sign off right now. <laughs> Deb, you're hilarious. Hilarious. She says, I love out of focus. It makes me look so much younger. Yes, doesn't it? I know. Um, Lisa Fowler says, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so very much. Good evening. Great session. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's sign off, guys, okay? I see so many more comments, and I can continue and continue. Um, thank you so much, guys, for all your love yesterday. Um, if you haven't seen my live chat with uh, James' husband, go ahead and, and check that out. Show him some love, you know? Um, he had a lot to say. I think that was very helpful in that live chat. Um, thank you so much for coming back and being with me tonight at such high numbers. I really appreciate seeing that. So I will see you guys next weekend with another live chat. I have some really good ones coming up. So stay tuned. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.